Good morning. How are you all today? Good? I don't know. A few of you answered. A few are just going, oh. It's been a long week. School's starting. My kids are, are a mess. I'm a mess because I had to get them ready for school. And life is just tough right now. And 9 o'clock, nobody said they were good. Everybody was just frustrated. So I'm glad you're here today because you're in the right place to get a little bit of hope today. Online campus, we're glad you're with us as well. Good to see you all. And uh, let's jump in today as we're wrapping up our series called When Pigs Fly. Now, we've adopted this from Life Church, and it's all about miracles and how miracles work and what God does through those. And, and, and it's been a lot of fun to look into the ways that miracles affect us and impact our lives. For most of us, when we hear the word miracle, we, we tend to think, oh, they just don't happen anymore. That's a when pigs fly kind of thing, like out there somewhere, maybe, sometime, somehow, but it's not going to happen. Or we hear the word miracle when we believe in miracles and we're waiting on one to happen in our lives right now. Or we've experienced miracles in our lives. And so many of us are in that category. Most of us still believe that God has done miracles, but it's been a long time ago. Like he doesn't do miracles for me in my life. That's like something from the past because he just doesn't do that anymore. Well, let's take a look at the definition of what a miracle is. It's when an all-knowing, ever-present God intervenes in our lives. An all-knowing, ever-present God intervening in our lives. And it doesn't matter what he does. It could be physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally. It could be anything. And God is there changing what your scenario and situations are. I mean, maybe there was a tumor and now there isn't. Maybe you were in a car wreck and you shouldn't have survived, but you did. Maybe you destroyed your marriage and there's no way your spouse should still be with you, but they are. Those things don't happen by sheer will. All of those things happen because God intervened in some way. Because God took control. God showed up, and now your life is so much different than what it could have been. We started looking at these four types of miracles that are in the Bible, the miracles of deliverance and provision and protection and healing. And the first week, we talked about God's power over the forces of darkness. And that one kind of freaked some people out. Because we like the fact that God's in control, but we don't like to really know what's around us. We don't like to know what's really happening. And isn't it mind-blowing to think about the fact that there are spiritual battles going on all around us all the time, and we don't see those or we don't want to see those? Ephesians six twelve says this, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And as we talked through that, it brought up a whole lot of conversation and discussion about what's happening around us. And then in our teaching series, we walked through the miracles of healing. And, and you see them all through the Bible. And, and all of us know somebody that needs the miracle of healing. And so we're all praying for those kind of things. And you see Jesus like giving sight to people that were blind, uh, allowing people that are deaf to be able to hear, allowing people that can't walk to be able to walk, even raise people from the dead. Those are pretty miraculous kinds of things, right? And they're pretty cool to see when a miracle, a physical miracle happens. It's pretty noticeable. Today we're talking about the miracle of provision. It's going to be interesting. I have a question for you. Any of you find yourselves in a situation where there is more month than there is money? You ever been there? Yeah, I think most of us have been there, right? I mean, maybe you're a single parent and you're raising a couple of kids and you're going, man, there's just, there's just no way I can make it. I mean, I just can't. There, there's, there's too much stuff going on and I can't afford any of it. Maybe you make a good income, but you're still trying to make ends meet because expenses are are so high. I mean, you're paying off your student loan debt, you've got medical bills, you've got car payments, you've got kids and all of their activities, and you're doing everything you can 
just to stay above water. I mean, you can't even go to Kroger today and get a handful of basic things for under 200 bucks. I walk out of Kroger going, I bought 10 things and it was $220. How does that happen? And then you go to fill up your car. And you can't fill up your car for under 60 bucks right now. Even if you have a Prius, and we do, and we can't fill it up for under 60 bucks, it's crazy how expensive things are out there. And that makes it difficult to keep ahead. But even with all the struggles that are out there, and some of you are just thinking in your mind, yeah, I've got, yeah that bill's due and it's past due and I've got to pay. I, I get it. Even with all the struggles, there's still hope out there, guys. There is. God still does some pretty incredible miracles when it comes to providing. I started looking through all the stories in the Bible where people were afraid that they didn't have enough and they were really struggling. Like, we, we don't have enough to make it right now. We just don't. And a lot of stories in the Bible like that. I mean, really, a lot of them. And, and there's always this encouragement with every story. With every story of a need, a true, definite need, there's a miracle of provision that happens. Read them. I mean, the Bible is full of them. All through the Scripture, every time you see a story of need, you see this miracle of God providing over and over and over and over again. It's, it's like the thousands of people that are up on this, this hillside. Jesus is teaching, and the disciples cry out to Jesus, what are we going to do? They need food. And Jesus just looks at them and says, uh, you guys feed them. Pretty simple, right? They're hungry, feed them. Okay, how do we do that? Listen to the scripture, Luke 9. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Beth Bethsaida. And the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. I mean, just kind of a nonchalant, oh, you need healing, here you go, it's all done. You know, not a big deal, right? But it's happening right there, and it was a big deal for the people. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging, because we're in a remote place here. And Jesus, again, he replies, you give them something to eat. And they're going, How do, what do we do? He, he said, we don't have, they, they're saying, we don't have anything. This little boy gave us a few loaves and a few fish. But unless we go out and buy food for all this crowd, how are we going to do that? Because there are about 5,000 men there. So it means you've got 10,000 plus people probably with their wives. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And the disciples did so, and everyone sat down, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people, and they all ate and were satisfied. And then the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls, basically the leftovers that were there. Twelve ba Why 12 basketfuls? I don't know, may, maybe so each disciple could have a doggy bag? I don't know, maybe that's it, take it home. Hey, when you're eating with this, this with your family, remember that God provided this in a miraculous kind of way. Now, in the Old Testament, I love the, 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 the account of, of Elijah, and he's talking to a widow. And this widow is scared for her future. She has absolutely nothing. I mean, she didn't feel like there was any hope for her future. And, and Elijah says, hey, go make me some bread. And here's what she says. I'm going to read the whole story, but this is my favorite part. She said, I don't have any bread. I only have a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug that I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself so that my son and I might eat it and die. How's that for a hopeful outlook, guys? We're going to eat our last meal and die. There's nothing else. There's not even enough to sustain us through this meal. We're just going to die. Here's the whole story of 1 Kings 17. Go at once, this is God talking to Elijah, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon 
and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? And she was going to get it, and he called out again, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. It wasn't her God. She was not following Jehovah. I, she said, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. And I'm gathering a few sticks to take home, make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Saw right through where she was. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and for her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with what the Lord had spoken by Elijah. That's a miracle of provision. You have nothing, but yet God is still taking care of you. You think that your life is over, and God says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Put me first. I'll take care of your needs. I'll take care of everything. More oil than you need, more flour than you need. And so they ate and survived at that moment. Now, in every story of need, what is there? There's a miracle of provision. And that's what you're seeing here. I love the story in Exodus where the entire nation is afraid and they're thinking, we don't have anything to eat. They're leaving you know, Egypt, they, they've crossed the Red Sea, they're in the wilderness. We don't have anything to eat, we're going to starve to death. So God provides a Panera bread in the middle of the desert to feed them. It's pretty cool to see that. Okay, it wasn't Panera, but it's as close to baguettes as you're going to get, all right? I, I mean, here's, here's what happens, Exodus 16. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Israelites tend to be complainers all through the Old Testament. And they said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food that we wanted. Isn't it interesting how when you look back, they were in slavery, they were abused, they were beaten, they were captives. How the past always looks better than the situation you're in. That's the Israelites right here. We had all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. And then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. I love this because God gave them just enough for that day, right? They couldn't bag it up. They couldn't save it. They, 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 they couldn't can it or jar it. It was just enough for that day because if they kept it to the next day, it was rotted and it had maggots in it. I thought that's an interesting description. That's how they describe it. You only have enough for today. Exactly what you need, exactly when you need it, that's how God provides for us. Do you realize that yet? Do you see that in your life? Jamie Loves, Lovejoy, uh, who's running her sound today, she has a pretty incredible story about how God provided just what she needed and just when she needed it when she was serving the people of Jackson, Kentucky. Watch this. So Dad and I go down to Happy Church, um, just he and I, not, we didn't have anything really planned other than just make a hot meal, feed the volunteers, feed any community members that came. So a lady comes over to where dad and I are set up and she lives in the trailer park that's right next door to Happy Church. Uh, If you've ever been there, you know which one I'm talking about. And, you know, the whole time I was there, I could see, you know, she had had some dogs on her on her front porch and she shared with us that she's you know she's leaving the area you know she's not coming back and she asked me if I wanted if I wanted a dog well 
anybody who really knows me <laughs> knows that I do not want a dog. <laughs> I know many of you love your dogs, and that is fine. I know they bring great joy to a lot of many people. Um, I'm just not one of them. And a guy comes up, guy comes up to us, and we're like, hey, you know, can we get you some to eat? And I hadn't seen him all day. You know, he wasn't, I don't know if he was a volunteer or a, a community member, um, but he comes up and he goes to shake my hand and he puts, puts money in my hand. And he goes, I'm, I'm supposed to give this to you. And, you know, in the context, I'm thinking, oh, you know, he wants to reimburse us for the food. And, you know, and I explained to him, oh, the food's been, you know, graciously donated. Um, you know, everything's, everything's been provided. And he looks me very clearly, very plainly in my face and says, oh, no, it's not for the food. That I'm, I'm, I'm just supposed to give this to you. Once again, the, the lady comes over, this time to get some cleaning supplies. And again, she, she says, we're not coming back. And I got something, there was a pull. There was something in there. And I walked over to where the dogs were. Um, there were four. Uh, there are four chihuahuas, of all things, <laughs> uh, in one cage, one large, you know, dog kennel cage, um, in, a, in some pretty deplorable conditions. It was right then that I just said, "Okay, all right, I'm I'm taking them." And I was like, well, I guess I'm going to Walmart. So I get to the dog section and there are two crates and there are two mats for those crates. And there is one protective mat tarp thing for a, for a van. My total comes out to one ninety-seven ninety-eight. One ninety-eight ninety-seven. One hundred and ninety-eight dollars and ninety-seven cents. I'm gonna be sure that I grab that money that that guy gave me, and I pull it out, and it's two hundred dollars. So I'm on the phone <laughs> with my husband, who also cannot believe that I have done this. Jamie, you don't have any dog. There's no dog food here. I'm like, okay, I, 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 all these closes at eight. That's the closest thing to me. So I'm gonna drive and I'm gonna run in. So sweet lady and her husband were coming out. She pauses and uh, she's like, hey, do you need a cart? And I was like, well, I do, um, but would you happen to have a few minutes? Are you in a great big hurry? I got these dogs, they're in the back of my van. I wanna leave the, you know, I wanna leave it open. I was like, but I gotta run in and get dog food. And she goes, oh, absolutely. She reaches in her pocket and she puts it in my hand, you know, just puts money in my hand. She goes, hurry, go, go in there and get some dog food. And I was like, oh, no, that's not what I, no, no, you get in there. And she had handed me a $20 bill and the food comes out to almost exactly, almost exactly $20. The provision all along this journey has, has been incredible. All along the way, people, they, they just want to help. I don't know that it necessarily makes me a dog person, but I'm definitely these dogs person. Aww. Jamie's in the booth. Jamie, will you stand up and raise your hand, please, so people can see you? Isn't it cool to see the miracle of provision? Exactly how much money she needed as she was following God's will for her life, God's plan. Multiple times. Now, here's part of where you might be able to do this and be part of this. These two are still available. Now, I don't do this lightly, and I will not do this for anyone else. This is a God story, right? These two are still available, and I, I don't know. <laughs> sold. We got one sold up here. Um, now, 
Uh, Greg Dodge, you might take the other one. I, I don't know, man. I'm just saying. Okay. Jason, uh, we got people. In, okay. See Jamie after church if you are interested in those. Um, <laughs> Jeff and Aisha. Joellen, please. My wife is standing up. We've got five dogs at home. You have six. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, my life just got a lot more difficult. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> and let, let's go to Philippians 4.19. I'm just going right through this. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Here's the deal. Don't miss this, all right? God promises to meet your needs, but he never promises to provide for your wants. Don't miss that. God meets your needs, but he never promises to provide for your your wants. And we really struggle this idea of God, where are you? I mean, I'm expecting you to show up and do exactly what I want you to do, like a genie in the bottle kind of thing. God, this is what I want. This is what I want you to do. And when you don't do that, I say, God, where are you? Because you're not meeting my needs. Don't, don't, again, don't miss this. He never promised to provide for our wants. And there's a difference between what we need and what we want. There just is. For example, we all need clothes to wear, right? But we all want something that's kind of fashionable, that's kind of in style. Just ask parents with back-to-school shopping. You need clothes, but you want, you know, you don't want to look like you're Walmart in a Neiman Marcus kind of world. That's just the way we are. Those are our wants. We need rest, but what do we want? We want a 14-day, all-inclusive, all-paid vacation on the Caribbean. That's what we want, right? Not what we need, but it's what we, we need a house. We need some type of shelter to live in. But what we want is a chic farmhouse designed by Chip and Joanna Gaines just for us. That's what we want, but it's not what we need, right? Sometimes God does provide for our wants, and there's nothing wrong with that. But he only promises to provide for our needs. And we need to understand when it comes to the miracles of provision that when God guides, he always provides. A little corny, but I like it. When God guides, he always provides. When God is the one directing you, when you're in tune with his spirit, when you're constantly putting him first, you may end up with a few extra dogs in your house. When you're putting God first, when God guides you, he will always provide for you. He'll make the provisions. Isaiah 58, 11, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Now, here's the deal with us as people and in our current culture We need to be careful not to take what God has provided for us and use it for our wants because that's where we get into trouble. That's where we get into bad sense. God provided our needs, but we took what he provided and we use it for our wants. Like you have a mortgage payment that's due at the same time as your car payments are due and you plan a vacation without knowing anywhere that money was going to come from to pay for that vacation and you still haven't paid off Christmas of 2021 yet. God, where are you? Why haven't you provided for my needs? Is it possible that God provided for your needs but you chose to spend it on your wants? It's not only possible, that's exactly what happens. God's going to take care of your needs. Quit looking at it like God is a genie in a bottle to provide for all of your wants. God's provision is not a get-out-of-jail-free card for our stupid financial decisions. It's just not. So be careful not to blame God for not showing up, for providing for our wants when he never promised to do that. But when we follow God's plan, when we're putting God first, 
He'll provide for all of our needs. That's such a cool part of God's provision. And don't miss this. God always multiplies what we give so that we can be part of the miracle too. Did you realize that you get to be part of miracles? He provides. He multiplies. It's a miracle how God works. Sometimes God is going to do things all by himself. Like he doesn't need us to begin with, right? He uses us so that our faith can grow, but he doesn't need us. I mean, you look at like the story of Jonah in the Old Testament. God just sends a whale to take, take care of him, right? I mean, uh, hey, uh, Jonah, hey, whale, big fish, whatever you are, however you want to describe that, swallow this guy for a while, will you? Keep him safe, spit him up on shore. That's all God. But sometimes God wants to use you to make the difference. Sometimes God provides a Panera bread in the middle of the desert. Sometimes he uses you to cook the bread so that you can be part of the miracle. So how does he do that? He simply asks you to give. And then miraculously, he multiplies what you give. That's how it works. When did, the, when did God multiply the widow's flour and oil? After she made a loaf of bread for Elijah. It wasn't before. It wasn't when she's thinking, I'm starving to death. It was after she made the bread for Elijah. That was the faith part that happens in this, in this story. God multiplied what she gave to be able to take care of herself and probably other people there. When did God multiply the loaves and fish for the people on the hillside? A couple of different stories of that in the New Testament, but the one that I love is when the boy said, hey, I've got a couple of fish and a couple of loaves of bread. If you can use it, here it is. It wasn't until the little boy gave up his lunch that God said, yeah, I'll take that. And then he multiplied it to feed thousands of people. That's part of the adventure of being a Christ follower. Now, don't, don't listen to what I'm saying on this and think this is a health and wealth kind of gospel. That, that's the kind of thing where, God, you're going to provide a jet airplane for me because I gave you $10. That's not how it works. Like if you kick in 100 bucks today in the offering, don't expect to go to the parking lot and see your 1999 Toyota minivan miraculously turn into a Ford Bronco, a brand new one. It's not going to happen. All right? That, that's not what we're talking about. Now, Randy Mosteller may give you his Ford Bronco. That would be a miracle. But that's not what we're talking about here. The miracle is God's multiplication and God inviting you to be part of the miracle process. 2 Corinthians 9.10 Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only for supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it's also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. When does God multiply the seed in that story? Once you sow it. If he multiplied the seed before you sowed it, there'd be no faith in that. God just does it, and you'd forget about God. He multiplied it when you do what you're going to do. And the principle goes all the way back to this thing called the tithe. I don't know, we hate talking about money, whatever. The tithe, what is it? The tithe is the first 10% of your income, the first 10%. Why? Because God has to be first in your life. It's not the last 10%. It's not if you have enough money to give to God. It's the first 10%. God says, give me the first, and I'm going to bless what you give and multiply it by the thousands so that other people can be blessed by that. That's what the tithe is all about. He goes on, and again, we just read that scripture. You will be enriched in every way so that you can have more for yourself? No. No. He said, you'll be rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Do you realize that when God miraculously provides, 
that you might get to be part of that miracle. That's a cool thing. That's a really cool thing to do. Maybe for you, I, I don't know where you are, and I don't know how God is going to use you. I think we all need to look at how our finances are because God knows that if, he, if he's first, your finances are in order. That's the way it works. You give God the tithe, everything else comes second. You lived on 90% before you met God. You can live on 90% again. First 10% is God's, and then God takes care of everything else. All right? I've seen it way too many times not to believe it. But maybe God's going to use you after you do that to do some incredible things. Maybe you go to Jackson, Kentucky. Tell you what, this next Sunday, I'm heading to Jackson after this service. Jason, you want to go with me? Bill, you want to go with me? I know, Randy, you want to go with me? Come with me. I'm going to serve food. I'm going to cook enough food for 300 people. I'm going to go down, set up in the parking lot, and give away as much food as I possibly can. Come with me. Come see me after service. Say, yeah, I'll go. You know, it's a three-hour trip down. We'll serve food for two or three hours. It's a three-hour trip back. That's a long afternoon, especially after being here for a Sunday morning service, right? Doesn't matter. God will use you and will multiply what you do to make an impact on the people that are there that desperately need him, that are looking at their lives going, we've got nothing left, and there's nothing more that we can do, and God's going, whoa, wait a minute, I'm getting ready to provide for your meal for that day. Come with me. Maybe you head to your neighbor's house, and you cut up trees and limbs and take care of their yard because it's a mess from the last storm that came through. Go God! Go do something that multiplies God's goodness to the people around you. Maybe you want to go and paint ramps for a group called Self for Handicapped Families. Yes, go do it. Maybe you find somebody in need and you provide for those needs because you can and because God will multiply that hundreds of times over just because you stepped up and did what only you can do and God can do through you. And God will multiply that. It's going to be an incredible time to see what God does. Don't miss it. Don't walk out of here, go home and sit on your couch and go, yeah, whatever. Get out of here, walk out of here and say, what can we do to multiply what God wants to do through us? And next Sunday morning, come and worship. It's going to be a quick worship service, some great music take communion together, challenge you to go out, and then you go and do. Being the church is not about showing up to a worship service. Being the church is about being the church. It's about being Jesus' hands and feet. It's about impacting the people around you with the love and grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. Don't miss it. Way too many churches have gotten way too spiritually fat And they never go out and exercise what they've got. They just soak it in. What good is that? It's no good at all. Be the church. Be part of a miracle. Will you pray with me? Father God, I'm praying for everybody in this room and everybody watching online. God, fill our hearts so full of you. May we put you first in everything so that you can use us to be a miracle in somebody else's life. God, help us not to miss that. You're not a genie in the bottle. You're providing for our needs so we can make an impact on those that are in need. Help us to do that. And it's in Jesus' name.